Corey? That sounds like Barbara. Corey, are you Barbara? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So welcome to the second part of tonight's talk. Um, that will be, again, uh, we're going to go to mobile now because part one, we did a desktop application. We thought it would be really interesting for, for you to see how we could take this desktop application, all written in JavaFX, and port it to the phones. You know, the, and we're going to and we're going to do that for both iOS and Android. Now, remember, when when you see what we're going to do here, you're, you're not going to see one line of Objective C code or Swift. Everything is in Java. Our goal was let's take our Java expertise, let's take everything that we did in, in Java FX with all the UIs, and let's see if we can put this on the phone and give it what we call a common look and feel, right? So the application is going to look the same on the iPhone as it is on the Android, okay? And, and that's what, you know, and, and this solution is not for everybody, but there are a lot of, uh, a lot of cases out there where people want that. Uh, so that's what, uh, what we're going to do. Okay, so this is our agenda for this part of the talk. Um, we think that JavaFX works really great on, on mobile. Uh, however, you're going to need some help. You know, you're going you know, to need some frameworks to do this. So we're going to show you two frameworks tonight. Uh, the Gluon framework. Uh, Gluon is a company that's in Belgium, and they are currently the stewards of JavaFX because, uh, what, about six months ago, JavaFX got unbundled from the JDK? With, with JDK 11. With JDK 11. Um, and there's a long story behind all that, but they did they did that, and so Gluon has taken over uh, the open source project for that. And, but uh, Oracle's still a major. Contributor. And Oracle is still involved in all that, but uh, Gluon is a major player in that. So once again, you know, you want to look to them for uh, you know the changes uh, for the releases and things. And, and Gluon is also doing long-term support for JavaFX 11 as well. The other uh, framework that we'll show you is a smaller, more lightweight framework called Afterburner, and we'll show you what, how we're using that. And one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about or realize, but when you do a mobile application, uh, it's very, very, there's a, it's more often the case than not that this application is going to have to store data in the cloud, right? Not on the device itself, but somewhere else. Or talk to the cloud in some way. Or, or talk to the cloud in some way. So, so how do you do that? And you know, again, help. Uh, Gluon has Connect and Gluon Cloud Link, so we're going to show you how to do that. In fact, we're going to take the blood pressure readings that were in the standalone application that we showed you in the first part of the talk, and we're going to put them in the cloud, and then we're going to have our uh, mobile application get the data uh, from the cloud and, and update it as well. Okay, so that's the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk is going to take a uh, Oracle database and put it in the cloud, and then we're going to use a really cool tool that we wanted to show you uh, called Oracle REST Data Services, o -O -R -D -S, or ORDS for short, and this is uh, something you can use from Oracle that will map REST calls to SQL for you. So you can make uh, a REST call and it will uh, generate SQL for you, hit the database, and then when the result set comes back from the database, the ORDS tool will convert it to JSON and then give it back to you. And this is really, really nice and very easy to use. So we'll, go, we'll have another little demo that Gail's going to go to show you that. And then, um, you know, we'll wrap it up at the end and, um, and I'll give it to Paul and he'll give away all kinds of free stuff. Yeah. Right? Okay, <laughs> sounds good. All right. Okay, so can't do this yourself. Well, you could, but it'd be a lot of work, right? Heck of a lot of work. So you need some help, right? Okay, so Gluon has, um, you know, is in this business. They, they see a big market here for people that want to do these kinds of things. So they have this Gluon mobile that you see in the middle here. And this is a very nice diagram from Gluon's website that shows you how the Gluon mobile will interact in a mobile application. So uh, uh, with the, on top of the Java, Java client platform is your client application. So you're interacting with the Gluon Mobile for, for what you need there. But notice that the Gluon Mobile has APIs that will allow you to access the native environment of the phone. So that means you have direct access to the camera, the accelerometer, the, you know, the compass, anything that's on the phone, GPS, everything. Uh, you have the ability to, to work with that directly if you want to. If you go up to the right in the top and then to the direct right, you can see that there is another part of Gluon framework called CloudLink that serves as a bridge between your mobile application and an enterprise system 
for example, um, Pivotal or Spring or something like that. And instead of you talking to it directly, you can interface uh, through uh, CloudLink and that will decouple those, uh, what you're doing. And then you can change uh, your enterprise system if you wanted to at a later time. Of course, uh, Glow on Mobile has one more uh, access and that is to, to direct third-party services. And that would be things like Amazon Web Services and so forth. But you could also get there through the cloud link as well. And you could get there through the cloud link. Okay, now I mentioned that we are going to use two frameworks uh, in our mobile application for the blood pressure. Uh, the other one that we're using is uh, the Afterburner framework. This is from Adam Bean, another Java champion that Paul and I both know. Adam lives in uh, Germany and he's a very popular uh, uh, Java developer. Um, and so uh, he, 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 get, uh, he puts this... Uh, Afterburner out there for people to use. Uh, what it does is dependency injection. Um, if you know if you know what that is and why you want to use that, uh, it will help you inject your FXML for your views and Java objects, which Gail's going to demonstrate in a minute. And of course, uh, if you use Afterburner, it uh, generates Java boilerplate code for you. You don't have to work as hard because um, it's doing that stuff for you. So the advantages is uh, you don't have to write as much Java code. Uh, it's, it's easy to use and it does things like it handles uh, singleton, you know, creates singletons for you and it allows you to create services that can be shared. So we'll show you how we're using that uh, in a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Gail right now and she's going to talk for a little while about um, this. Uh, this is our blood pressure program now on the phone, on a mobile device, BP Cloud. And she's going to talk not only about the decisions that we had to make to go from the desktop to the mobile space, but also how uh, we use the Gluon uh, utilities to do this and so forth. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, general stuff to discuss with you. And one is that uh, what does it take to create a mobile application using JobFX using the Gluon framework? Well, you need their uh, framework, but you also need if you're if you're tar if you want to target the iPhone, you need uh, to be an Apple developer, and you need to to have the Apple development tools installed. Um, but once you have that and you have the developer tools installed, installing an app on your iPhone is uh, simply a matter of. Um, Here to this is so small I can't see it. Uh, for the uh, iOS, it's launch iOS device, so you connect your phone using a USB cable, and you can download it to your device. And then for uh, Android, it's up here. Android install. Okay. So, uh, and then for the Android, you also need to install the Android development tools as well. But you don't have to access them once you have the Gluon stuff installed on your IDE of choice, and they have plugins for NetBeans, IntelliJ, and Eclipse, and they install Gradle as well. Then they control all the builds, and when you're actually downloading the app to the phone, they do a whole bunch of crunching. They have to make it so it'll run on both those targets and. How they do that is actually going to be changing over time, but we're showing you what is what they have right now. Um, anyway, so from our perspective, it just works and it's Java, so that's that's really nice. Okay, so what I want to do is just show you a little bit. Um, now you're familiar with the desktop version that I showed you, and and I'm running on a. I call this the desktop version of the phone because this is not a phone. This is just on my desktop that it looks like a phone. But just to show you that um, we have it installed here as well. So I have my phone connected to the Mac and you're looking at QuickTime. So um, I can show you an actual phone. So this is it running on the phone. And, and so one of the things that Gluon did was that um, JobFX is, is, uses CSS so that you can 
style your controls. And they took, uh, JavaFX has a standard styling, and they took that and they modified it. They used the Google Material Design uh, design guidelines, and they created a set of controls that you can use that are mobile friendly. So with touch events, I can scroll up and down. And this is the equivalent of what you saw of the table view. We now have this really cool, they call it the charm list view. So it's like a, a list, but you can put uh, buttons in it and go to other views. So the, the big thing that you'll notice is that with the previous program that I showed you on the desktop, you had four areas. Well, you can't have four areas on a mobile phone. It just wouldn't work. So you have to create a, a separate view for each of those four areas, and that's what we've done. Um, so we have the, um, the table view, which now is a, like a list view, and we have the charts. And it has the same <coughs> stepping through, so this should all look familiar, and then the bar chart. And the bar chart here does the uh, display of whatever happens to be displayed in the previous line chart. Um, so that was the big thing of taking, um, so I think I'm going to, oops. This one. Okay, what? So, um, make sure I include everything. Oh, yeah, that's what I knew. That was something I want to tell you. Um, the other thing that this list view does is it has what are called floating headers. So you can see as as I scroll up, the previous headers that are not needed go away, and that's just really nice. It also has. With this is a floating action button, this plus, and you use that for um, the, the main thing that you want to do from that screen. So in this case, the main thing we would want to do is add another reading. So that's the plus sign. And you, you can have any icon in there that you want. And you'll notice that this add a reading and the edit a reading look very similar. The other thing you can see is that the screens kind of uh, transition in really nicely, and that's another, uh, it's one line of code to enable that in your view. Okay, so what, what does the um, overall project look like? Well, as we didn't show you any FXML before. We said, yeah, we were using FXML, but we didn't show it to you. So now I want to talk a little bit about using FXML, and if you, um, the FXML is under the resources. Yeah, so here we go. Edit.fxml. So if I double click on this, it opens it and it brings up an app, a standalone application called Scene Builder. And you can also download this from Gluon. It used to be distributed by Oracle and then they they decided they didn't want to maintain it, so Oracle took, I mean, Gluon took it over. So you can get it from them for free. And it's a drag and drop tool that you can use to design your view. And this is the edit screen, which is also the add screen. And you have controls over here that you can drag and drop. You have a view down in the lower left that's a hierarchical view. So FXML is an XML based uh, declarative language, and it, it's hierarchical in nature, which uh, fits in really well with the JavaFX scene graph, which is also hierarchical in nature. So that's a really good fit. If you select on a button, for example, then you can use the inspector and reconfigure it. So that's all I'm going to show you about that, but just to know that it's there and Scene Builder creates FXML code. Let's click this and say, well, what does FXML code look like? So we can edit it. And so you can also edit it in a text editor as well. And you'll see it is very hierarchical in nature. Uh, you have components like a vertical vertical box that have children, that have labels, date picker, another hor uh, embedded horizontal box with the date spinners. Uh, here are the text fields. And notice this uh, FX ID 
that's a way to label a field so that in your Java code you can access it because um, this is a you know a static representation. But when things happen and users do things, you want to be able to uh, control it with Java. The nice thing about uh, FX. ML of using FXML is it reduces Java code. So you can you don't need to use FXML, you can use all of this in Java, but it's a very verbose to instantiate all these <coughs> controls and call the um, setters to configure them. So it's really nice having FXML. So um, what I want to show you, so each FXML view then has a corresponding controller class or presenter class. And this is the one for the edit class that we were just looking at. So he, these annotations, um, these are how you access it. So this doesn't instantiate them. It's these uh, uh, controls are instantiated by the FXML loader. So this whole process of things that reads the FXML and, and parses it and instantiates these objects for you. But this is how you can access them in your code. So. Um, So bef before we talked about, oh, JavaFX is really nice for GUIs because it has observable properties that can take listeners, it has observable lists, and it also has, as I mentioned before, a really nice um, library for doing concurrent programming because as someone pointed out, the, uh, the GUI updates have to happen on the Java application thread, but you want to be able to if you're, for example, going to the cloud and reading data, you don't want to freeze your UI while you're doing that. Um, most of that code is done behind the scenes by Gluon, so actually you don't have to worry about that too much. They handle that, and we'll talk more about that. Um, so what I wanted to show you is uh, line 71 is a listener, and this is um, a change listener. And this gets invoked when the edit view comes into view. So the showing property has changed, it comes into view. And there's, this is a bunch of uh, housekeeping tasks that we want to do when it comes into view. I also wanted to show you uh, uh, JobFX has uh, uh, action uh, event handlers. So this is an event handler that we've attached to the submit button, which either is an update or add, depending on if we're in an add or a update view. And again, we uh, the housekeeping stuff that we have to do to add or edit a reading. And then down here, this the familiar bind. So um, in in this application, we're disallowing edits on the date and time controls. We're saying if you want to update. A reading, you can update the values of the, the systolic, diastolic, and pulse data, but not the, uh, the date information. So here we're saying, hey, if we're in edit mode, these things are going to be disabled. Um, and of course, this all looks really familiar <coughs> to you because of the last. And here is an example of now the Fluent API. So this says that the submit button should be disabled if, and again, it's really similar to what we showed before, any of the fields are empty. Okay. Now the, the um, final thing I just want to discuss really briefly is that this data is in the cloud, so the um, Um, so the data is the same, and um, for this application, uh, we have an authentication requirement, and that makes sense because if you have personal blood pressure data in the cloud, you want it only for you. You don't want Joe and Harry to access your blood pressure. They want to access their own. So uh, Gluon provides authentication either through Twitter, Google, Facebook, or you can use your own uh, pass uh, username password and once you've authenticated you didn't see me put any password in because once you authenticate it stores the information on the device so in this case it's on the computer and on the case of the iPhone uh, it's stored on my iPhone and then 
And I also want to show you that this is an Android. Um, and I don't have a way of showing it to you except for to hold it up. But we also have it running on the Android. Okay, and it's the same thing. Show it to Paul and then tell him that I see it. It's there. It's there. It's there. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, that's it. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. Okay, is this the right time to ask questions? Yeah, sure. No yeah, so you said that uh, Bruno had taken the Google um, material, material design. design. Is it the same look and feel on, on iOS and yes. on... Yes. It's exactly the same. Yes, exactly the it, same. It is, and if... I've heard that some people want to make them different, yeah. but um, so Google provides... Google did this. They styled the controls to kind of to follow to follow the Google's material design so you know I myself can't say I'm super familiar with that because I the only time I use an Android is to do this um, but for those of you fan Androids you're probably really familiar with what that means and what the, what the controls look like but it's basically a really flat design um, but it doesn't mean you, the behavior is exactly the same because this still is an iPhone, and I still, for example, to uh, dismiss an application, I do what the iPhone says, and in this one, I do what the Android says. So there's some subtle differences. Can't be so. Yeah. Can you step through the bug that on iOS? You can. Um, I'm not sure if you can step through, but you can certainly get console information out. Just log it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, there there may be more advanced tools that would allow breakpoints and things like that. But no, I, I you know, think that you can. Files. I ha I don't have very much. I have to say I don't have very much experience with that. But um, you can uh, use the. Um, so I think it's on the Android. You can use uh, a debugger. Well, what about the simulator? Though? Not the phone itself, but the simulator on the computer. Could you step through it? Then? And that means you you can have uh, breakpoints and wash points and everything there. You can do that. Yeah, but I don't know. But I I don't know if the if simulator is phone, any different than saying, the phone then, itself. When the phone is connected, you do get you can get information from the phone. Yes. So and it's just can you step through? I'm not sure, but you can get console information. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, go back to the notes, and we have question. something. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, how does oh. this actually run? Is there a full JVM downloaded to the phone that runs? Yeah. Really? Um, well, okay. JVM, so, right? um, so I believe in pre in Java eight and earlier that. Um, yeah, I think I think they do. They 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 create an executable that is like a JVM, and I know that they're working to use in the future to Grawl. use Grawl to so that they can. Yeah, use that's what's happening right now. Is there's a big effort versions. at Oracle with Grawl to compile these uh, things to native platforms. But even on the Android, they have to do things because um, the Java on Android is is not. It's like a, it's mm -hmm. like a kind of a uh, mix between six and seven. So in order to lambdas, um, they have to yeah. create and like no anonymous right. and no streams. Yeah. Uh, what does that do for performance and memory usage and that sort of thing? Um, well. I, I think the performance <laughs> is. Um, it may not be appropriate for games, but it's the performance is pretty good and the size of the of the application depends on what kinds of resources you have. So if your application has a lot of photos or things like that, it's going to bloat the size, but it's very performant. Yeah. Measure, you know, I, I haven't measured everything. That <laughs> but some of the, some of the folks at, at Gluon have, have acknowledged the fact that, you know, in high-speed gaming type stuff, there can be some issues with this approach. 
But for normal UI, like we're doing, and people are interacting with it, it's, it works great. And also, the, uh, the Gluon guys have written the conference application that DevOx uses. And in using JobFX in their system, it's downloadable from either the Android store or the uh, Apple iTunes store. Um, and it's, you know, it does fine. So if you wanted to look at something that was like, these are, I have to, you know, these are uh, example applications. We haven't put any in the stores. I mean, you can, there's, you know, you can put them in the stores, but these are for teaching. Um, but if you wanted to look at a, at a real application, there's, and we have a bunch of others we've done, but we're just concentrating on this one. So we have a really cool one that does maps and yeah. stuff like that, but, you know. You had okay. To limit it. okay, so let's get back to this now. We have something really cool to show you here. Sorry, we have one more. Just a quick question. All right, well, we're going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This will be a quick one. How large is a Hello World APK or IPA? So just with the JDM and the libraries? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's not I, that big because I mean, we talked to Johan about that, and he yeah. said it's really based on the amount of resources you have. So yeah, if you have Hello World and you don't have a lot of resources, it's not going to be that big. But at JDM and libraries, like 10 megs? But, but megs. It, well, but with Java 9, you have modules, so it would be smaller, right? Yeah, but we're not how, using, how we're not using yeah. 9 here, but that's the goal. Right. How big is your PPM? This app that Okay. Yeah, maybe afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Right. Because we still have some more stuff to show you guys, and we don't want to be here all night. Okay. So um, let's take, uh, let's show you something else that Gluon gives you that's really cool. Um, this diagram here is showing you what we did in the first part with the desktop application. We had a UI control, we had a, a JavaFX observable list, and then we had our local data, right? And then we showed you how to attach listeners to these things and to bind to them, right? So Gluon says, hey, if we want to work at the cloud, why don't we have the same idea where we have a UI control working with a Gluon observable list that can then work with cloud data. And of course, what's happening in this Gluon observable list is it's hiding all of the messy details of working, of, of, of accessing the data in the cloud and doing all, all of the access for you to do that. So what we can actually do with this technique is we can do remote binding now. So we have the same idea with local binding that we showed you in the desktop application. Now we're going to show you that you can have remote binding. And the reason why this is powerful is because uh, what we're going to do in, uh, in the next demo that Gail's going to show you is we're going to have, uh, we have three devices hooked up here at this point. We have the Android, we have the iOS, and we have the desktop. And when Gail makes a change on one device, it will update all the other devices automatically. And, that, and the technique for doing that is this remote binding that we're going to show you, okay? So, rather than show it to you first, let me show you how easy this is in, in, uh, with the Gluon framework and the Gluon observable list. So, let's go to the next slide and uh, let me show you what they did. One of the things that I really like about Gluon is they just make things very simple and easy to use. So uh, they came up with these concepts of write through and read through, and these are called sync flags that you that you make to the call to their library, and uh, these options apply to observable lists and observable objects. When you specify a write through, that means that the remote copy is going to update when any of the when the local data changes, and when you specify a read through, uh, the local copy will update when the remote data changes. Now the difference between list write through and list read through uh, and the object read throughs uh, is that a list will notify you when something has been added to the list or removed and the object write through or read through will be used when you want to know when an object has changed inside the list. So you typically, uh, for remote binding, you want to have all four of these on and these are called sync flags and, uh, and Gail mentioned if we go to the next slide um, that there's authentication mode too, uh, so you register your application on CloudLink, which is part of Gluon, and then they give you your application keys, and then you can create a Gluon client as simple as this in Java. <coughs> you, uh, you, you have the Gluon client builder, and you call the create method at that point, and you supply the credentials that come back from, uh, from Gluon at that point, and then uh, use the builder to build it, and now you have a, a Gluon client. And when we go to the next slide now, 
we will see uh, a, a code snippet from our program for the service class, and this is the code that you would write to, uh, to do the, um, the remote binding. And you can see, uh, for getting the data, uh, you know, what we have is we have uh, a data provider retrieve list, and then here's the glue on client that you saw on the previous slide, and then you would call the create list data reader. Uh, you would get the credentials um, that you need and give it the class file for the data. That would be the blood pressure um, reading itself. And then you just specify these uh, sync flags and they take care of everything. So let's show them how that it works. And hopefully the demo gods will work here because, but we are on ResMed's uh, and, and it's, it, I think it's, it's, been, be okay. it's been good. So what Gail's going to do now, she's setting it up, is she's going to, she's going to go, she's going to bring up all three devices that are all displaying the same cloud data, and then she's going to make a change on one device and all the others are going to update, we hope. Okay, so on the desktop one, we're going to go to the um, chart view, and um, we'll make the change on the Android because, um, so when she puts this in, uh, you'll see if it works, right? The line chart will move. Uh, you'll see it move, and then they'll be uh, on the left, and then um, on the iPhone, uh, the reading will be updated. Okay, so I'm going to change uh, April 27 to something uh, a really, high read. Yeah, really. Because you're nervous, reading, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there it goes. So you saw but the light the, chart. But the, the iPhone didn't change. See, this is why we... <laughs> this is the, really? It didn't? No. Um, yeah, we, but, we, um, we had this big discussion about whether we should run on our hotspot or not. Did you uh, me, reset? Um, yeah, reset that again. Um, but it's not the same as having it dynamically up change. Yeah. See, it's it, it's changed up in the cloud, but it's, it should change there. And I, there's been I don't know issues with the. Um, I don't know. Android work fun. Well, change yes. It on, change it on the iPhone and see if the Android will update. Oh wait, well. Mm -hmm. okay, How so. many people have an Android phone? <laughs> there we go. How many people have an iPhone? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did the Android update without touching it. No. I didn't. No. Do I have to reset the program probably? Uh, well, it, it works at home. So it works at home. <laughs> yeah, it works at my machine. It works at my machine. It works at my machine. We have a question in the audience. Okay. Yes. Yes. How, what is actually happening here? Uh, is, it, is it the cloud that is pushing? Or yes. Is it the cloud, the, is pushing. the cloud is pushing it to the devices. And that's, and that's because the sync, uh, the sync flags, now you can set it up so it, it won't do that. So, um, I don't know, did you talk about what the write through and the read through mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's, and, and I think under the hood they use service and events. Yeah. But um, that is, you don't see that because it's, you just specify the flags and it, I have to have so a different bottom line example this morning, right? I can't do desktop and in the same time. Um, in terms of like a big screen with everything on the screen, like I showed you in the first part of the show. Could, could I make an app that would run on all three? Yeah, so, I mean this. Yeah, that's I what mean this. Okay, yeah, I thought this I need the same project. This same app is running on all. Well, three do you, if you want. Um, I thought it was a different code base. Um, no, it's the same code base. No. See, we Talking just deploy in glue on in the in glue on project. You just say deploy to Android, deploy to iOS, and they take care of the all. source. The Java source code is all the same yeah. under the One hood. The executables, uh, the the mobile targets get massage. The, F the FXML is very yeah. different, right? No. 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 The FXMLs are the same. It's the line charts, the bar the charts, all the exactly same. The same. Nothing. Wow. The source code is exactly the same. But um, the, um, so there's, I mean, it knows what kind of, it, it can ask what kind of device am I running now? How big am I running? So you, I can run this also on an iPad, and it will make itself bigger to run on an iPad. 
But if on iPad, if you wanted to take advantage of the increased real estate and have and have it look different, you would have to have. Um, but you could do this, I think, in the resource. Just say use this view for the iPad. So know that I'm on an iPad and use this view. And it, at some level, you might start having all sorts of if I'm doing this, if I'm doing this. But um, so on the previous question, just to elaborate more on the first session, you showed the BP app in which the graph and the bar chart were on the same screen as well as the right, data list. Right. Is that view basically that's the thing that is different between that application as a desktop app and the phone oh, wow. application? Right. Okay, so let's let's yeah. back up yeah. a little yeah. bit. Yeah. The no, so the so. application that we showed in the first part yeah. is not the same code base oh. as this, <laughs> but this little desktop simulation is. Right. So yeah. I I misunderstood the question. So yeah, that. In fact, we made that desktop app way before we even knew about Gluon because we were looking at an example of using JavaFX, using binding things, using charts, and we just made that up. And then we said, okay, let's move this to mobile app. And, and then, you know, obviously we couldn't have uh, everything on there. Yeah. Ooh, would it be safe to assume that if you adhere strictly to a model view controller paradigm, that the view of the desktop would be just one section of that, and the model and the controllers underneath are things? Yeah, that in, in a sense, we, we did yeah. that because there were four parts to the desktop application, and we basically took each one of those four things and made them views so they could slide in you know, on the phone. And, and you saw that. that I mean, it is a different, completely different code base because yeah. we just didn't say this is a requirement, you right. know? But there's a lot of code that's really similar, the, the binding expressions and... and yeah, everything. it's all the same. But I, we also changed um, the code, like for example, the, the desktop app, we sorted things from the oldest to the newest. And in this app, we said, you don't want to do that, you want to have the most recent thing come up first. You kind of have to think differently. Mm -hmm. um, the, it just seemed really obvious that, okay, I want my most recent blood pressure to show up first. So we reversed the sorting criteria. So we made changes as we went along, and there was never a requirement to make it the same. So you mentioned you get uh, information off of the device using uh, the library. Okay, so like uh, some phones can take BPs and stuff. Uh, how is it different oh. code base so that we read it from different devices, or is it just the same type of call? Yeah. Read blood pressure or oh. not beats uh, uh, per minute type thing off the sensors on the phone. Okay, the, this isn't using any sensors or anything. This no. is simply data that, that so you can put you would pick manually. Up a, type in your blood pressure. You take I mean, I know you now you can get devices that you just put on and it yeah. just puts the. Yeah. But but this is a, this is like I said, it's just an example. This you you put the stuff in manually. So maybe a different question would be, does the Gluon library provide access to the yes. various sensors that are on yes. different phones? Yes. You don't yeah. have to worry about it. Well, you might have to worry about it. They oh. provide access to a set of like the common things, camera, cell alarm, compass. Now, if a certain phone has sensors that are not generally um, available, they have a way that you can write an interface to it. So they're accessible, but you may have to write some handshaking code if it's not in their library. Yeah. Yeah. So on one of your first slides in the second part, you showed the glue on. Uh, I think the glue on the network component or something. Yeah, the glue on mobile part of the framework, right? Yes, the one that is in the cloud. Yeah. yeah. I guess that is the component that it gets pushing the data to yes. to yes. these yes. observed with glue on observable list. Now. If I have an application that is deployed onto 100,000 phones, this, this, this component is going to be very busy. Yes. And I can imagine there's going to be some fee that I will have to pay to Blue On uh, for that service. Yeah, they, yeah. It's, yes, they, yeah. it's not free. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the model that they have. The most cloud companies are, are, are going in that direction. But yeah, you know, the, we're, what we're showing you is all free and, and No, easy. it's not. It's the, the, using the cloud is not free. What, I mean, uh, I can show you their website, but yeah, I mean, the 
to do a simple, um, if you don't want to access the cloud, there, the Gluon framework is free. But if you want to do anything with the cloud, which most certainly you would, then that's not. But you don't have to use Gluon cloud. You don't have to use it. But they make a very compelling argument that you would want to because of the um, uh, the behind the scenes stuff they do for the sync flags. So you have to use their cloud link to use that feature. Do they give you some free credits like Oracle Cloud? Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> We've been into JavaFX for a long time since it came out in Oracle when That's it was a question. scripting language. And we've just always said, JavaFX is cool. We really like JavaFX. And so when we found out that Gluon had this, this system, we said, okay, we're going to learn about it. So yeah. um, we think it's cool. Yeah. So if I wanted to expand this one to be also a desktop app, is that possible? Sure. It could be. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, let's see. We're off script, so here we go. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, let's see, wait. Somewhere. Okay, here he is. Gluon has different kinds of projects. You probably can't see that. But um, you can have a Gluon desktop project, and you can have a Gluon mobile project, you can have a Gluon mobile project that uses FXML. And uh, so a single view project on Gluon VM. So this is, this is their, um, uh, what's the word? It's, it's, it's their experimental version that uses um, Java 9 and their own VM. And I think they're not going to go in the direction of having their own VM because they're already doing a lot. I think they're going to use the Graal VM. And uh, stay tuned. Though. Not here yet. Okay, so can we can we finish up this last part here because uh, let's, we, do let's do it. Let's do it. Yep, that's right. Okay, so if we go back to the slides, uh, we did want to show you another cool thing that you could do in a mobile application, um, and we're going to show this uh, uh, with an Oracle database. But the idea here um, is that you can take CloudLink and you can make REST calls that will then be mapped by the ORDS tool to, um, to uh, SQL. And uh, the advantage of this technique is you could, without, without this approach, you could put the REST endpoints in your code, but then if you had to change them for some reason, um, you know, you'd have to update your code. But and if all you, your users. And all your apps. users, right. So uh, there's a CloudLink has what's called a remote function feature, which is what we're going to show you in a, in a few minutes. And what this does is it decouples the REST calls uh, from your mobile application, so that you can um, you can uh, hook them up to various providers. Once again, like Amazon or FN Project or, or and Gluon Function as well. So um, you know the messy details of the REST calls and the REST endpoints are decoupled. Because you can, you know, you can go directly, but if, but if you go through the ORDS tool, uh, then it's a lot easier. So if you look at the next slide, uh, this is what the ORDS tool does for you. You start with a URI, uh, and then when you enter the, the ORDS tool, it will translate, it will map and bind the URI to SQL, and then you'll hit your database with an SQL statement. When the result set comes back, uh, it will, uh, the ORDS tool will transform it to a JSON object, and then you get a nice JSON object that you can parse back in your Java code. Uh, you can view this directly with calls, and you can also use stored procedures, right? Okay, so um, the last demo that we're going to show you is not a very complicated one. We have a, a full CRUD database in the cloud. Um, it's uh, actually, we call it a people demo, but it actually uh, represents an employee data record. But uh, you can do uh, create, read, update, and delete. And um, we're going to show you a little bit about how we can implement these remote functions. So um, if, you, uh, if you go back to the slide for a second oh, here, I want to okay. show them the remote functions before you do this. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, now remember, we're going to be making rest calls in this uh, particular application. This is not the blood pressure app, it's a different one. So what we've done is we've, we've mapped these rest methods uh, that you rec as you recognize, read, post, put, and delete, and we've mapped them over to these remote functions so that we can get um, a list of employees, we can get a single employee, we can create a new employee record, we can update an existing employee record, and we can delete an employee. And, uh, and, and when you come up with these remote functions with REST calls, before you actually implement them, you can use uh, what's called uh, Gluon's dashboard, and then you can use that to test it, and, uh, and then, and then um, even use mock values uh, until you get it into your production code. So you want to show them the dashboard now. I just want to make sure I'm still logged on. So this is, um, we have an account in Gluon, and this is our uh, Gluon dashboard where we can create remote functions. Um, so uh, we're demoing two things here. The first thing we're demoing is Oracle's ORDS tool, which allows you to uh, make your Oracle database REST enabled. And when it's REST enabled, you can use regular REST calls to do the full CRUD operations. And you can test that using curl, or there's a program called Advanced REST Client that is a little bit more convenient to use because you can create JSON payloads, which you need for updates and creates. Um, then once you have your, your REST working, then you may want to create some remote functions that then you can call from your mobile app. So you are not making REST calls directly in your uh, mobile application. So for this, um, um, well, I just wanted to show them real quick the, um, the application just so that they have a context. And um, we have this running on, again, all three. And I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up on the phone just because you can see it easier. Okay, so um, it, it looks kind of the same as, as the, um, the blood pressure one, but it's just we're just displaying data. We've changed the, um, the major color, so it's teal instead of blue, but we've used the same uh, edit in throwaway icons, and we still have a plus at the bottom. Uh, we don't have any other views except for the edit add view that you can make changes, and that looks really the same. So, but all of these calls are, are done using the remote functions. So let's go back to the dashboard now. And here they are. Um, there's other ones in there, but create employee, delete employee, get employee, and get employees. So let's, and, and you can um, create, we've created uh, REST remote functions, but you could also create an Amazon Lambda function, an Azure function, an FN project function, that's an Oracle thing, or a Gluon function. So you have any of those cho choices for the kinds of functions that you want to create. And we use REST. And um, so the get employees, for example, this is the, the REST endpoint, and we can test it. And that, that, this is a live test. It goes out, and those, that's the same data that we saw. But it also has this really awesome feature that you can enable mock responses, and then you get data back. And we actually were demoing this at a conference, and it didn't work. So we put in mock data, and no one knew. <laughs> it just worked. It was great but I'm using real data. So, um, okay, so um, I think that's... Yeah, so but I, I think what we should do now in the time that we have, let's bring up the code and show them the remote functions and then we'll just, we'll just okay. show them that. Okay, yeah. So we're gonna bring up the, the code right now and show you how easy it is to write these remote functions uh, and 
you know, you, you can see you can use the dashboard to test them. But you're going to talk. Well, you're not going to talk from this. No, we'll right? just do it right here. It'll be faster uh, okay. because we're we're, we're getting close. Okay. To so can you? You're okay. Do so basically, um, the, the remote service has get employees, get employee. Gail scrolls down, create employee. These are the uh, uh, remote functions that we talked about, and so this is all Java code. Let's just take. Um, Let's just take the uh, don't take the delete uh, no go back up the top yeah let uh, get uh, employees. employees is a good one um, the get employees right there is going to call use a remote function builder from Gluon and you say dot create and you give it the name of the method and it, you, we're getting back a list here but we're using the dot object because it's a JSON object that contains the list of items inside of it. Um, and if you go down to get employee, you can see that another, uh, besides the create and the object, there's a dot param. So this makes it very easy to say what employee do you want to get the record data from. And remember, when you're writing these things, uh, the, the rest endpoints uh, are, are being converted to SQL and you're hitting the database. So all of that stuff is going on behind the scenes. This is all you have to do to write the code to make that happen. And if you look at some of the other ones, um, there, there, there may be a raw body that you have to use as well. That's when you um, s either when you need to send JSON to the um, remote function. Yeah. Um, so and then the delete employee down below has the same concept as the other one. Uh, which employee do you want to delete? So you're using the dot param there. But uh, it, it's very very simple to put these together. And again, you know, we're, we're sparing ourselves all the details of working directly with REST endpoints, and uh, and then we have an Oracle database uh, in the cloud that is. And in doing this uh, development um, on the Oracle end, the actual URL that we use changed. So here's an example where we just had to go into the API dashboard and change the REST endpoint. We didn't have to change any code in the application. That was really nice. Okay, so let's go back to the notes, and uh, we had some, well, I had some of the code snippets in here, just jump right to the summary here. Um, and so, you know, the, the, we just looked at, the, the, some of the notes that you see here are the ones that we just went over, so here's the get method. Oh, we'll stop here for a second. Uh, this is the dependency injection that you need. Remember we used the afterburner framework, so there's the inject for getting the service, and then the FXML for the charm list that Gail has provided, and then we're using um, you know, some other a change listener here to make that work as well. Um, and then we looked at this, this code here uh, is also what, what we looked at, and then if we skip ahead a couple slides, uh, there's the delete that I talked about, and now we can get um, wrap things up here. Okay, so what we tried to do tonight, um, we went through a lot of stuff, but we wanted to show you the advantages of using JavaFX, um, the uh, platform independent source code, uh, the JavaFX brings to the table the use of observables, uh, listeners binding, and bas background tasks to sync your UI. Uh, Gail also showed you things like charm list view and so forth uh, that, that has flexible skinning for the mobile platform. And again, frameworks are important in this world. Uh, we demonstrated the Gluon and Gradle framework. Uh, again, it's all based these days on OpenJDK. You just saw the Afterburner framework, a smaller one they were using. And then we also demoed um, how do you put a database in Oracle Cloud and interact with it through the ORDS tool. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, we're right on time here at this point. Um, this is, um, this is, these are our Twitter handles and our email addresses. So, I don't know if you want to talk to us about anything. Uh, can you go to our website right now and uh, if you, uh, asgteach.com, Gail's going to bring it up right now. And we put up uh, the San Diego Java Users Group this afternoon. There we are at the top of our home page, right? So um, we're going to put a link to the code that we showed you tonight on there. Um, it, it won't work because I'm not going to give you my credentials, <laughs> but um, I, I'm going to write a little readme file that says, you know, says that, but you can look at the code and you can, uh, I think you could run some of it on the desktop, I'm not sure, but it's not there now, but it will be there within the next day or two, I promise. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you.